the studio here with me and I are going to share our best tips to help you create memorable abstracts, memorable titles that not only get you clarity and direction, good support from your supervisors, but also help you get accepted to conferences, get your paper sent out for review. With that, we're going to dive straight in because we got a short session today. Um, I'm going to head straight over to Courtney for this week's quick tip. Yeah, so my top tip this week is actually very simple, but also very important. It's to back up your work as you move along. So I've had an issue recently with my own work, which is typically backed up to a cloud. And I know, David, we had an issue with a student that also hadn't backed up their work and also was set back for that. So if you're backing up to the cloud, make sure that that cloud is always catching the most latest version of your work. Um, and if you're not considered using a cloud service as a second backup to saving on your hard drive. Yeah, I personally use Google Drive. That works well. It automatically syncs. Dropbox is good. I mean, it always seems to happen to students who are back up against the wall in a panic right before submission. I, I don't know if these things are running hot and then something is gonna gonna like burn out or go go pear shaped. But yeah, that and it, and it often ends in tears. So don't let that happen to you. Really great tip, Courtney. I'm glad you mentioned it. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna jump straight in, like I said. And what I'm excited about here is we got two really good submissions. Uh, I think you're gonna get a, a lot of value out of yourself if you struggle with these areas. And um, the first, I, I think, let's Courtney, let's go through the title question. So I'm gonna just read out the question. I'm encouraging you, those of you in the future, to send us videos of yourself with your questions and topics so that we can play it back so that everybody else can fully understand uh, what what you're wanting to know. But I'm just gonna share here very quickly. Okay. We've got this is from Saeed and Saeed says, OK, um, you know, it has a question. My main question is related to the title. I'm going to zoom in so you can see. And uh, I know, Courtney, we've got some background noise from you in the cafe, but um, that, that's OK because we're both out of the office. So, OK, so the field of research is education. And the title, I'm just going to blast this out so we can see it, is studying the effects of adopting the blended and cooperative learning and teaching process on enhancing EFL students' soft skills and academic achievements. <sighs> Got to breathe after that. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack here just in a title. And um, so much I can diagnose from a title that often if your title is unclear or not on point, it's often a sign that there's a deeper problem with the underlying research that you're going to do. So in some ways, a title is not just a title. So uh, yeah, the other thing I want to point out, if you run out of breath trying to read your title, it's also a sign that something's just a bit off. Courtney, your immediate reactions here on the title, and then the, the site also shared some comments from the supervisor. We're going to come to that in a second. But Courtney, your, your thoughts on this first. Yeah, my thoughts are that, like you said, it's very, very long. Uh, I would also suggest shortening it. It also seems a little bit jargony, you know, in the way that we talked about how to, um, like, broaden out a research idea from like a very specific context to a hotter debate. I would like to see that done with this title a little bit. So to take a little bit of the jargon out and, and pull out the broader question that you're investigating. Um, that yeah. might appeal to a more wider audience, not just someone who's very aligned with your area of work. Yeah, you kind of have to know what's going on to understand. You have to be in the field to get this. And some, some of it's just uh, exactly, I would say jargony. You're talking about the EFL. You've got to spell that out, at least in the title. But some of it's vague. There isn't a clear question. It's not coming into contact with that big gap, studying the effects of... Um, and it's hard to see the effects of this on what, because some of these things are vague, like academic achievements, that's a very vague outcome. And, and teaching approaches, and teaching approaches could be anything. So this doesn't really say anything. So I'm already gonna do a little bit of surgery here as I'm looking at this. And, and I wanna remind you guys, remember our framework that we often use, doctors love this, and they like it because doctors like clarity and direction. Doctors have to get the research right because people's lives are on the line. So it just uh, it, 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 you know, doing humanities is one thing, but uh, getting getting this research right is really like can be no exaggeration, life or death. So I like using these PICO models, even if your field is not medicine. And I like to know what the population you're studying is. That's the PNR model. Um, what the intervention or exposure or area of interest is. Uh, that's the I. 
uh, comparison group that can, can be there. And I think that's actually there here and what the outcome is. And I think one of the challenges in this title is it's not really doing a good job satisfying that PICO model at all. So the, the, the population is, it looks like it's EFL students. So I think this is English as a foreign language uh, students. I, I'm not sure because it wasn't spelled out. But I'm going to clarify that. So that satisfies could satisfy this. So we're just going to call this EFL students. I like to know what level they're at. To to be clear, are these uh, are secondary school? Right? Are they? Where are they? So that's, I if I'm understanding that correctly, um, and then uh, the intervention here appears to be the effect of adopting the blended and cooperative learning. I think so. I. I think the main one is maybe, I'm not really sure what the intervention is. And I'm not sure what the baseline is. So I think in this case, you're maybe comparing, say, to traditional um, teaching and your intervention. Is it is it this the same name for the same thing? Blended? Is this blended as a mix of online learning or in, in person? I'm, I'm not really sure. So I'm going to put a question mark for that, but that needs to be clear. Um, and the outcome is not clear either. Courtney, Courtney, are you seeing some things that maybe I'm not seeing on this? Yeah, I think it's, you're right, like soft skills, academic achievements. Hmm. Why do we care? And I'm confused. If it is English as foreign language, why do I care about teaching them soft skills? Aren't we just trying to teach them English? I'm, I'm yeah, confused. the relationship between that and academic achievements. Yes, yeah, so yeah. this is this is really unclear. On enhancing their soft skills, I, I would pick one main, maybe one main outcome here. Maybe, is it language acquisition? You want to see how well they're picking up language? It's not obvious. Yeah. Um, so this, this outcome needs to be fixed. So I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to delete this. And I'm going to delete some of the unnecessary words. And the, the effects of, the, I want to turn this into a question to make it less vague. So maybe we could say, instead, uh, let's turn it into a question. Because what, what I like to do is you take a sentence and you turn Pico into a linking sentence. So let's just make up an outcome at this point. Um, Courtney, how about we just say uh, grades? Gra grades. Yeah. Um, so does, does adopting blended learning Im improve the, the gra uh, grades uh, of Eng English? as a foreign language EFL students. Okay, at, at least now, Saeed, we may have kind of diverged from what you're doing, but we have now in this shorter sentence, all the elements of the PICO, and we have a research question built in. And we've made it in a way that anybody, even anybody outside your field can probably understand, although blended learning, blending learning, blended learning, still might be a bit jargony and and unclear um to to some people also the field. Courtney, is it, what do you think of this yeah i was thinking like a term that more people might be familiar with is like e-learning or yeah or something yeah. e-learning uh, e e is good e-learning methods improve grades or engagement there's different outcomes you could think of here and you don't have to just do grades but you want to be clear about what what the what those outcomes are that you're looking at so uh, with that i want to go look at the comments that are coming from the professors and i also want to say if you guys those of you watching um if you have any questions of your own or uh Saeed, if you're watching definitely jump in and uh let, let us know if we've missed anything here but let's look at their professors comments and see what what they came up with so i've been told by my supervisors and some colleagues the title is too long it contains many key words that should be limited to three to four maximum yep 100%, and uh, I agree with that. I think we've covered that now, Courtney. Focus on only on studying one approach, either blended or cooperative one or rather than both. That's exactly what we were saying here as well. Um, soft skills is too vague and should be limited to some three or four clear items. So, Saeed, yeah, I, I mean, I 100%, uh, Courtney, do you agree with these comments? I think this is exactly what we've just kind of doctored up here a bit. What, um, this, this all seems really valid to me. Uh, for yeah, I see. Yeah, the student, he said he felt lost after the remarks. And I think there is a lesson here, which is like, hmm. take what's useful and 
because I know, Sahid, if you're on the call or if you were here and could talk to us, you could tell us in 30 seconds probably all of these questions that we had. Like, is it grades? Is it so? You are the you know your research better than anyone. I wouldn't, I would try not to feel too overwhelmed by comments like this. Um, mm. Just take them one by one and, and sort of break it down the way that David and I are. That's a really great point, Gordon, because I think sometimes, you know, you're putting yourself out there with your research and then your professors come back with these comments, you feel like, ah, knife to the heart. And it's just kind of gut, it just it feels like you just got ripped in half. But um, I, I found these really helpful comments. I mean, yeah, you're right. So you said on the a comment continue, how are we going to assess the effects of these approaches, academic achievements are hard to say 100% that as an outcome that's very hard to follow. And then Saeed says, I felt lost after the remarks. And what am I supposed to do? How do I tweak my research? So, um, yeah. Uh, so these are things I really encourage you guys. Look, we use these tools in Fast Track for a reason, because they help our students get clarity and direction and have structure. And that structure is important because even when you get these comments from your professor, they're actually following a structure. Uh, those professors may not have made clear that there's this structure behind the scenes playing out, but um, that structure is, is making sure you've got these elements made clear. Um, so we kind of take it apart one by one, piece it together to make sure you got the necessary ingredients. And thanks for sharing this, Saeed. Let us know in the comments, um, if you're watching later, if this is helpful, how you get on, and let us know what title you actually come up with. A lot of people who are gonna watch this video later are gonna be really interested in how you do. Um, any last thoughts on this, Courtney, before we move on to the abstract? No, I think this is a good a good stopping point for that. Cool. Um, okay, so I'm going to move over to the Thanks. abstract. I think I've got this on the same Word document. Right, so here we go. We've got from Natasha. Thank you, Natasha, for sharing this with us. So if you've got an abstract that you want to submit to a conference, and main questions are, I'm going to break these up so it's a little bit easier to read and uh, just increase the font. Um, these are good questions that you want to know uh, if you've got all the elements you need to have. You need to include references, keywords. Is it readable? Is the research question clear? It should be more detailed. Good questions. We're going to look at all those things. And that far, um, you might have to mute for a second, Courtney. Uh, so now you're in a cafe. The uh, research has not been yet completed. Okay. Um, that's 100% okay. I've I, I'll tell you a little secret that I shouldn't say. There have been times that um, I had very preliminary results that were very preliminary, and I just dropped them into an abstract and made it look as if those were the results, but with some framing to say that this is to be confirmed by our subsequent models, just to give enough of an appetizer, because I knew by the time I got to the conference, the research would be completed. Um, so that, that is okay. This is a conference aspirant. It's intentionally meant for you to go out to the field and get feedback. So that's okay. Uh, you don't have to have your research completed as yet. That said, I do encourage students to think of conferences as marketing for themselves, making connections, contacts in the field. So I do like if you can choose some research, I, I'd like to choose you to submit research that's uh, already towards the completed end of the spectrum. But if not, it's totally okay. And people understand that in theory is the purpose of the conference. And your research is limited only to Slovenian cases. Yeah, I, I think there's unfortunately this bias on, uh, oh, if it's Slovenian, it's not gonna be as widely relevant. So I think I agree with you just strategically not to emphasize it too much. So we're gonna take a look at this. And I'll, 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 this is a little bit delicate. We'll look at the way you phrase this about your research not yet being co completed. And we'll take a look at these elements. Um, yeah, Courtney, put, put you back in here. Do you have any, these are good questions. Really glad you're asking these, Natasha. Courtney, you have any thoughts on this too from your experience? Because I know you've written a ton of abstracts. Um, yeah, I do the same as you said. So I often apply for conferences that are a year away. So I'll put in a statement like preliminary results suggest ABC. Yeah, that's exactly. right. Yeah. Yeah, and, I mean, in a year's time, nobody's going to, I mean, it's natural that the research would, would evolve. So um that's totally okay all right let's pull up this abstract i'm excited to look at this um and we're intentionally looking at this for the first time with you guys um so okay impact i'm gonna bold this so we can kind of break it up impact of social networks on the use of phraseology okay this is good i actually have to admit my i want it's a great pleasure to work with so many interdisciplinary students i don't actually know what phraseology is um i can guess 
Um, I mean, I guess in linguistics, how things are, yeah, maybe dialects used or cultural choices of, of phrases, I guess. I'm not sure, but hopefully this is going to be all explained here and find out. But I, I like this title. This has the Pico elements um, and and it's it's a clear title. So, so far, so good. Um, I might like something, a colon here where you can maybe explain what method you used or what source of evidence you, you brought together to bear on this question. Um, so just keeping that in mind, not strictly necessary, but I would like that. Okay, let's let's read through it very briefly, Courtney. Uh, if you read through it, I'll try to um, increase the font size here a little bit so easier to read. Um, and I'm just gonna look at it very quickly, Courtney, while you're probably doing the same. And it's helpful just as I'm looking at this to know how many words you've got. Um, okay. Good. Okay, glad we've taken uh, a good uh, minute and a half or two to judge this. Uh, okay, there, just by way of background, you have two kinds of abstracts out there called structured and unstructured. This is going in an unstructured abstract, which is more in the humanity style, where everything is just lumped together in kind of a big paragraph or text. Uh, a structured abstract is used more in the natural sciences. Um, and I, I think what we're going to do is we're going to take this into a structured abstract for a second and convert it back into an unstructured abstract. And it's kind of like what we just did with the title, where we broke the title into the Pico components and then put it back together. Um, we're going to do the same thing here and make sure we've got the background, uh, the method, the result, and the conclusion. And uh, that's usually the way a structured abstract is made, so it forces you to have all those elements together. Um, and so we're going to break it apart and put it back together. So I'm just going to Come here and track changes and and go go here. While I'm doing this, Courtney, do you have any kind of background, like overview remarks or thoughts here? Yeah, some background thoughts. Um, I'm missing from the background a, a sort of an idea of the significance of the research area. With mm -hmm. why is this research area important? Uh, the aim also is coming at the very end of the of the abstract which normally we'd like to see up front, uh, maybe the third or yep. fourth sentence at least. And then I'm a little confused about what specific method is being, I know yeah. where, the, where some of the data is coming from, but how is it specifically being evaluated? Yeah, exactly. I think that oh, oh, kind of the order, I, I like the ordering to, to be presented in as linear a way as possible. So let's go through each of that. Uh, each of those are really good points, Courtney. So, and I think we can bring this down. It would be nice to know the overall word, ca word counts and what we're playing with. I think it's maybe a 250 word abstract. This, so let's just stick with that. I'm going to guess that and, and, and go here. So one principle in writing is to cut unnecessary words and vague words um, to be more concrete, specific, and definite. Um, we have this in some of our writing training, the elements, which if you haven't seen already, 100% free in our Facebook group, send me a direct message, get in touch, and we'll link you up with it. It really helps a lot of our students, especially if they've never had any academic writing before. So in the digital age, um, that's fine. This is a little bit vague. Um, uh, phraseological un units, um, I would say frequently used appear prom we could just say appear prominently on social networks. Um, often uh, appear using probably um, uh, like particularly in tweet. Exactly, particularly uh, on Twitter uh, and uh, in tweets, uh, something like that. So we can say what platform. So I'm guessing. I'm, I'm thinking this is kind of foreshadowing. Well, maybe you're going to look at Twitter 
Um, but then you say something about newspapers, ma magazines, and fiction. So we just kind of want to suture this up so it's a little bit tighter together. The characteristics of the, the use. So their verifications and modifications have not been systematically evaluated. So I don't know what the, the research question is. So you're saying, although their appearance on social networks is more noticeable, I think it would be helpful to take phraseological units and just clarify what's meant by that. I just kind of want to look for myself now. Um, hang on, let me just pull up a um, pull up something. Let me see if we can pull up a, uh, a browser here in uh, Chrome. Give me two seconds, guys. You're going to see the insides of our studio here. I want to know what phraseological units are. Uh, umbrella term, multi-word units of language, multi-word units of language, whose meaning is not composition. This might be obvious in your field. Phraseological units or multi-word non Compositional phrases appear commonly, particularly on uh, uh, on Twitter. I don't think we need to to say tweets necessarily, um, and then say yet um, it is the the their linguistic because as your characteristic linguistic characteristics um, variations. And modifications. What do you mean modifications? Is this from regular language? Uh, um, you know, have not uh, are not not well understood. Um, so I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding the main point here. Above all, the function of emphasizing. Ah, okay. Uh, although, although um, they appear to emphasize spread, uh, emphasize socio-political and culturally relevant messages. So I'm still struggling a little bit to see. So in the background, your background needs to say, kind of answer, why are we having this conversation now? What is the burning question? So you're saying that these this types of phrasing really appears on social um, network media, um, but we don't understand, I guess, linguistic characteristics, but they appear to be being called upon to promulgate or propagate the social, political, and culturally cultural messages. I think, I think. But so Natasha, you've got to check this. I'm not sure. What you especially need for this background, I'm just going to put a comment here, is we need to explain very rapidly what's the gap. If you, if you don't know what the gap is in your research that you're trying to fill, um, you don't have any business writing an abstract yet, or e even going to do the research. So I think you have a good answer to that. Um, we work closely with our students to make sure they have crystal clear clarity on their gap, and it really helps all this writing down the road become easier. Courtney, any thoughts on the background before we chop apart to the next section? No, I'm just really curious about what what's the importance of these units? Like what do they do for society or for yeah. research perhaps? Yeah, I'm kind of curious. I'm curious what what's going on here. Um, so it sounds like it's exploratory, um, which, is, which, which is totally okay. But we just want to understand why are these so important to study? Have they not been studied before? What's the value added that you're bringing here? So here we go. In the corpus analysis, so you're just jumping straight into in this corpus analysis and we need to clarify that. We can see below you say, with the genus corpus so it's a uh you know we took uh we evaluated the genes corpus covering uh circa oops and i can't find secret 200 million words and i guess it covers phrases as well because you're doing phraseology uh, from tweets forum posts news comments are these all on social media or is this also written media because are, are you comparing social media to conventional media? This is this is a little bit unclear. Um, use uh, Wikipedia um, blogs and blog comments. It's a little strange because you're kind of foreshadowing here. Why are you singling out Twitter? Um, so I don't really understand because now you're going and looking at water social media. Um, so I'm, I'm just shifting this around. Um, uh, and then it looks like you coded this and, um, uh, we, we, we then coded linguistic parameters, 
including the type of social net network and its specific. Something's missing here. Um, the type of so we can just say this instead of type, it'll carry over type of social network, phrasal logical unit, and and frequency of use. Um, as well as the function. So this is a, a, a little unclear how you did this, um, but that's okay. Um, what, what do you think here, Courtney? Yeah, I think all your, your edits are spot on. And it, there's still, we need to know from Natasha some more information about what she did. But yeah. just to go back to that point you made about sort of um, talking about Twitter earlier on in the background, and then we get to the methods and we see that, you know, it, there's other sources that are also being evaluated. Um, I think there's a broader tip here, which is just to, you know, I can see a student writing this from starting with the background and knowing that this is particularly important to Twitter. So that's why the student might have put that. Um, but their evaluation is focusing on other things. So the idea here is that when you're writing something like a conference abstract, um, yeah. sometimes you have to hold back your knowledge a little bit. Just like it might make sense that, you know, this is particularly important for Twitter, um, but your work isn't focused on Twitter. So just leave out yes. that bit then from the beginning. Exactly. Social networks, uh, social maybe social network media, um, but I think, why don't we just say social, digital social media, I think. Um, and, and get rid of Twitter here because you're not really going down that path. And I think this is streamlined a little bit. So you can see now if we put these back together, we can actually cut, get rid of this background and get rid of this methods. And it actually reads directly and we can, can go like this. And, and it, it just flows back into an unstructured abstract. Okay, results. Here we've got nothing. So I would already say our preliminary observations um, are, or, or like our preliminary findings reveal that something here of, well, what's the payoff to this? What are you gonna show us? And then your conclusions, I realize it's premature, but I would then say that this aim, I would just rephrase this to say this, this, these, these findings will help um, elucidate, and I'm using a bigger word than has to be, or let's use a simpler word, it will help. Um, uh, uh, Maybe uncover. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uncover some underlying mechanisms which activate the use of. So, okay, so part of the question, your question is, what is motivating? Why are people using these phraseological units? So I think that's a question or not well understood. So we sought, sought to evaluate the why, um, you know, people use alternative phraseological units by evaluating. So we kind of bring this in closer contact. So these will uncover some Let's just say some reasons why people use these logical units of social media and redefine some phraseological. Ooh, I don't understand why you want to redefine these uh, features. Um, are, are you creating it? So uh, this this gets a little bit field specific. I don't really know if I follow this. Courtney, do you follow this here? I think um, by evaluating the social media more traditional phraseological features are their definitions are broadened. By Those also help extend phraseological theory to capture, um, you know, it's the uh, you know main uh, to to ad adapt its major features such as stability reproducibility and expressiveness to uh, use in the digital era something like this i think maybe you know, natasha is what's going on here 
So I think if you can flush this out, this looks pretty good to me. This this now flows. Um, I think that's it. I think that's there. So you can phrase this as a tentative conclusion of why are these results important? Why should somebody care? Why are they going to want to have your abstract, have you do a presentation? And I wouldn't be a little bit shy about being bold and saying that this is going to be really, why is this really important? I mean, you're you're obviously investing so much time and energy because you believe it's important. Um, you know, make that known and 100% clear to people reading this so, so they know why they want to come listen to you. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is good. Natasha, my read of this is you have the relevant, uh, relevant elements in here. Just maybe you've gotten a little bit close to it. And it's helpful to kind of step back and see the, the big picture. So my main suggestion of you, just recapping, clarify this gap. Clarify your main research question, which I think is this in here now. And um, I think we've streamlined the methods a little bit here. And um, make sure that we haven't written anything that's incorrect. We changed it because we didn't understand it. And then put in your preliminary findings. And it's okay if they're fully preliminary and weak. And that, that's okay. You're saying they're preliminary. And uh, make sure we haven't um, completely messed up this this part, but you want to say something about what does this mean? What are the implications? Courtney, any last thoughts on the abstract here? Yeah, I would just say that when you're filling out those preliminary results, just stay away from jargon there too. So we we sort of fine tuned a little bit to make it uh, less jargony and just make sure you also do that when you're filling in that results section. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just going to broaden broaden your audience. So if you can get away from jargon, you might not always be able to, but if you can, we always recommend it. And and now I can have something maybe here after the semicolon um, to what you're doing. It still seems to me you're not really looking at now the impact of social networks per se. Um, and so that's a little unclear. It's not clear to me how, well, I guess so. Um, why? So there's a little bit of a little bit of lack of clarity in here. Are you like the impact of social network on the choice of phraseology? It's it's not here how you coded the social network from these tweets and sought to see how that network impacted on, on the phraseological unit. So maybe explain that a little a little bit more. How how this is kind of like this is your independent variable, this is your dependent variable. Um, it's a little unclear how with this corpus data that you're, those two are being connected or related to each other. Um, yeah, so, if it's, okay. yeah, sorry, Courtney, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, if it's, if you're sort of doing, if it's more exploratory and you're and you're just kind of scoping out what's, what's going on, you can even shorten it, I think, to just social networks and phraseology evaluating the James corpus or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it, it is much more for a conference. And so yeah, that, that can work pretty well in uh, in the humanities. That very simply um, goes well, evaluating the James corpus. And in looking at this, there still might be some later on some need to justify why you're looking at Slovenian. Um, I could go either way for putting that in the title. I think on balance, I might leave it out. Um, but that's kind of a strategic decision. It's more accurate to leave it in, um, but strategically, I might leave it buried in here. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and come back. I think guys, this is a great stopping point for today. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Um, we, I would, we got a, a couple couple comments on here uh, that I, I want to take. Um, people saying, yeah, um, that was really impressive. Thank you both. Okay, great to hear. Awesome. Glad you guys are getting value out of this. Um, I always learn a lot. I, lo I love seeing these really fascinating topics. I, I mean, I learned something new today, phraseological units. Uh, I got to find out more about that. That's pretty, pretty cool. Be interested to see how many people talk about cancer or other choice of phraseological units on social media about, about certain kinds of events would be pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, so you come back, let us know what you came up with. And uh, Natasha, so let us know how, how you're doing your abstract. Again, it really inspires the community when you can share that that with us. So, um, okay, good. Glad to hear that. And uh, Natasha, if you're watching, I'm going to uh, send you what Courtney and I have just edited for you. I'm glad you're get, getting value out of that. Okay, wishing you all a great weekend from both of us. Courtney, is ever really nice to see you again. Um, and yeah, we will be back here Friday at our usual time next week. Send us your submissions. My email is davisduckler at fasttrackgrad.com. Courtney's at Courtney McNamara, fasttrackgrad 
www.ghostbusinessclub.com and we will look forward to seeing you then. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.